Welcome back, mitochondria, for another episode of Cancer as a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. I'm excited to be back with you today talking about vitamin D to continue on in our, our micro series about this important steroid vitamin hormone. And in the last several videos, we talked about its diverse actions and in the prevention of disease through actions on mitochondria and autophagy as a whole, as well as the antioxidant response element. Now it's time to get into the nitty gritty and talk about vitamin D's actions on various cancers and through what mechanisms it works upon. So I wanted to start off with one of mainstream medicine's sacred cows, and that is that sun exposure is what leads to melanoma. And that has pretty much been debunked at this point. Mainstream medicine can't cope with the fact that sun exposure doesn't cause melanoma, but literature is pointing towards that as being the truth. So one of the most feared reasons why people avoid the sun, slather sunscreen on, put on UV blocking clothes is because they are afraid of melanoma. And I just wanted to start off with a couple of papers here. So this is paper from 2021. It says the role of vitamin D serum levels in prevention of primary and recurrent melanoma. And it says that mean and median of the vitamin D serum levels were significantly lower in the melanoma group. Instead, we found a negative association between melanoma and vitamin D serum levels greater than 30 odds ratio of 0.11 with a p-value of less than 0.0001. So basically what that's saying is that people who have melanoma in general are associated with low vitamin D levels. And you're going to see that that is the truth with most cancers. But I wanted to just go ahead and take an ax to the sacred cow here and show that it's also true for melanoma. In this paper in 2019 titled Decreased Vitamin D Serum Levels at Melanoma Diagnosis are Associated with Tumor Ulceration and Higher Tumor Mitotic Rate. And it says here, our study suggests that a role of vitamin D levels in melanoma aggressiveness and raises question as to whether vitamin D levels should be monitored or even supplemented in people with low yearly sun exposure. And we'll talk about in the future why that's probably not going to be enough and why most of us that are in the know about vitamin D are pretty much anti-vitamin D supplements at this point because it's not just vitamin D from the pill, 25-hydroxy vitamin D and 1-25-hydroxy vitamin D that are causing the overall benefit and reduction in all these diseases. There are several other components that are not being accounted for. And when they supplement people with vitamin D with a pill, it doesn't make up for that discrepancy. So that's why I personally and Others like Dr. Jack Cruz are against supplementing with vitamin D if you have access to UVB light and maybe even a better strategy for those who live at a high latitude who have a significant vitamin D winter would be to invest in something like a spurty vitamin D lamp or the new chroma lamps that have UVB output. The cool thing about the chroma lamps is that they are mixed with red and infrared photobiomodulation. And actually, as a matter of fact, one of my favorite companies, EMR Tech, just came out with a red lamp. They, they probably make the, the highest quality photobiomodulation devices in the world, but they came out with a new lamp that also has UV light integrated into it. So you're getting the benefits of the UV while also the balancing of the infrared light. Although it, I would never recommend that over the sun, never in a million years. But that being said, for those of you who cannot move to a lower latitude or live at a lower latitude, who are left dealing with the idea that you have a significant vitamin D winter and that your vitamin D levels are going to plummet in the winter months, fall, winter, and sometimes even spring months, if it remains cold and the UV index is low, that may be a decent option for you to maintain yourself at that latitude. So this is another paper titled The Association Between Serum Vitamin D Level and the Risk and Prognosis of Melanoma, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. And what it's saying here is, however, the prevalence of vitamin D deficiency was significantly higher in patients with melanoma than in the controls. In terms of prognosis, serum vitamin D levels were significantly higher in melanoma patients with lower Breslow thickness. Breslow thickness is important for prognosis and determination of survivability from melanoma. Moreover, melanoma patients with lower vitamin D levels had a significantly higher mortality death rate from melanoma. So as you can see, these papers really turn what people think they know about sun exposure on its head because the big reason why people are avoiding the sun in general is because they're afraid of melanoma skin cancer. However, if you take a deep dive into the literature, you see that melanoma is actually going to be a higher risk of development in patients with low vitamin D or low sun exposure. The thickness of the melanoma is going to be higher and it's going to have a worse prognosis and those who have the lowest amount of vitamin d at diagnosis do the worst in general with melanoma so i hope that underscores that getting out in the sun is not a dangerous proposition when done in an, an intelligent way and that means that you're going to get outside at various times of the day morning afternoon and evening both for the circadian rhythm balancing aspects of it but also for the uv aspects of it that allow us to build vitamin d from that cholesterol molecule 
without burning ourselves to a crisp. That is the goal. And that may take some time, depending on what your skin type is. Your Fitzpatrick score is it may take a while of you just getting mostly morning exposure and mostly evening exposure with very minimal UV exposure, letting yourself build that solar callus, getting the benefits of the infrared light while slowly increasing the UV exposure to where you can handle higher amounts of UV light through the production of melanin and other chemicals such as uricanic acid. So now we're going to dive into the actual anti-cancer effects of vitamin D and vitamin D analogs. So in this paper titled Anti-Proliferative Activity of Non-Calcemic Vitamin D Analogs on Human Melanoma Lines in Relation to VDR or Vitamin D Receptor and this other PDIA3 Receptor. And what it says here is the anti-proliferative activities of 21-hydroxy-D appear not to require VDR translocation to the nucleus, which explains the high efficacy of this non-calcemic pregnant calciferol analog in SKMEL188B melanoma that is VDR negative. Basically, in this cancer type, the vitamin D receptor is actually deleted. So you would think, well, if you got vitamin D, this you're not going to get any benefits from this, from giving vitamin D or getting sun and getting extra vitamin D in your system. And that has been shown to be false because there are ways that vitamin D act in a manner to influence the anti-cancer effects of vitamin D without the actual VDR receptor being present. So in most cases, you're going to get kind of a double or triple whammy through various mechanisms of how vitamin D and its analogs work. But even if you had a cancer type subtype that actually where the vitamin D receptor is deleted and mutated and not functional, you're still going to get an anti-cancer benefit. And this is saying that the anti-proliferative activity of side chain truncated vitamin D analogs against human malignant melanoma cell lines, vitamin D compounds are versatile molecules widely considered as promising agents in cancer prevention and treatment, including melanoma. Previously, we investigated series of double point modified vitamin D2 analogs, as well as non-calcemic 20S hydroxy vitamin D3 and 21 hydroxy pregnant calciferol as to their anti-melanoma activity. Surprisingly, short chain vitamin D analogs were found to be biologically active compounds. So this just underscores the need for vitamin D, for vitamin D analogs to maintain health, but also in your fight against cancer, especially in this case, melanoma. And this is just a really cool slide of showing how the vitamin D three derivatives, as well as the lumisterol hydroxy derivatives, L3 derivatives have various mechanisms, anti-cancer mechanisms. They help repair DNA damage and they help upregulate PPD3 and having a DNA repair response and anti-cancerogenic effect. It's going to help decrease inflammation through decreasing and blocking activity of nuclear factor kappa beta or NF kappa B, which is a major activator of the immune response. It's going to have effects on the endogenous antioxidant response element through NRF2 signaling, as well as other anti-cancer, anti-proliferative, and pro-differentiation effects. One of the things I wanted to mention that's really cool is that a lot of these actions from these D3 and L3 derivatives of vitamin D and these cytochromes, these CYP proteins or these cytochrome proteins that are responsible for the conversion to these various protective derivatives actually happen within the mitochondria. So just chalk up another important role of mitochondria in maintaining health and preventing disease and reversing disease. So this is a topic that I have been waiting for for a long time to be able to share with you. And I hope it was worth the wait because I wanted to explain cancer metabolism and the Warburg effect in detail so that you understand that when we implement these interventions, such as vitamin D therapies, why we're getting such a diverse benefit and how it's very important in the fight against cancer. So this paper is titled Vitamin D Regulation of Energy Metabolism in Cancer. And that should raise some eyebrows. Energy metabolism in cancer, that reminds me of hyper-reliance on glycolysis or the Warburg effect. And is it possible that vitamin D has a direct effect on the Warburg metabolism? And the answer is yes, a resounding yes. So in this paper, it reads, vitamin D exerts anti-cancer effects in recent clinical trials and preclinical models. The actions of vitamin D are primarily mediated through its hormonal form, 1,25-hydroxyvitamin D, or calcitriol, the activated vitamin D that's been activated by the kidneys and the liver. Previous literature describing in vivo studies has predominantly focused on the anti-tumorgenic effects of the hormone, such as proliferation and apoptosis. However, recent evidence has identified 1,25-hydroxyvitamin D as a regulator of energy metabolism in cancer cells where requirements for specific energy sources at different stages of progression are dramatically altered.
This is very exciting because not only is it having an effect with apoptosis and programmed cell death of cancer cells and effects on autophagy, but it's also altering metabolic flux used by cancer. This is what I believe is the heart of vitamin D's anti-cancer effects. The literature suggests that 1,25-hydroxyvitamin D regulates energy metabolism, including glucose, glutamine, and lipid metabolism during cancer progression, as well as oxidative stress protection as it is closely associated associated with energy metabolism. Mechanisms involved in energy metabolism regulation are an emerging area in which vitamin D may inhibit multiple stages of cancer progression. So this is where I am personally in awe of the human body and our ability to fight back against disease. So vitamin D is going to have several positive effects on cancer. It's going to lower glucose metabolism, which we'll look at in detail. It's going to lower glutamine metabolism as well. It's going to decrease lipid metabolism or the creation of fatty acids necessary for cancer progression. And unlike in normal cells where we have an antioxidant response that protects against oxidative stress, vitamin D is going to have the opposite effect in cancer cells. It's actually going to lower cancer shields and lower its defenses against oxidative stress and actually make them more susceptible to oxidative damage, which is the main mechanism behind why some of the anti-cancer drugs and supplements and nutraceuticals work. This is an unbelievable chemical, and it is being synthesized in my skin at this very second just by sitting outside. And it can be done in your skin by doing the exact same thing. How amazing is that? Free. No doctor's appointment necessary, no pills necessary to take, just powerful anti-cancer interventions in the comfort of your own home. Let's dive into glutamine in particular, okay? So as you can see here, if it's in red lettering, it's saying the expression or activity is directly decreased by 125 hydroxy vitamin D. And if it is highlighted in red, that's saying that there is a decrease in amount of flux from 1-hydroxy vitamin D. You can see that this SLC1A5 enzyme, which is transporting glutamine from outside the cell to inside the cell, is downregulated by vitamin D. And the necessary enzymes to convert glutamine to glutamate, which is then used within the TCA cycle of a cancer cell, is also decreased. These two enzymatic proteins are decreased by vitamin D directly. I'm also going to touch on it because it's in this slide. It's also decreasing key regulatory enzymes, such as this FASN enzyme, and it's going to decrease the pool size of these fatty acids that are necessary for the proliferation of new cancer cells, which is exciting. This paper is showing that 1,25-dihydroxy vitamin D inhibits glutamine metabolism in Harvey Ras transformed human breast epithelial cells. And it's saying here that breast cancer is the second most common cancer among women in the United States. The active form of vitamin D, 1,25-hydroxy vitamin D, or calcitriol is proposed to inhibit cellular processes and prevent breast cancer. The current studies investigated the effect of 1,25-hydroxy vitamin D on glutamine metabolism during cancer progression. Treatment with 1,25-hydroxy vitamin D significantly reduced intracellular glutamine and glutamate levels measured by nuclear magnetic resonance by 23% each. Furthermore, 1,25-hydroxy treatment reduced glutamine and glutamate flux determined by cellular kinetics by 31% and 17% respectively. Ultimately, these results suggest that 125-hydroxy vitamin D alter glutamine metabolism in breast cancer cells by inhibiting glutamine uptake and utilization in part through downregulation of SLC1A5 transcript abundance. Thus, 125-hydroxy vitamin D downregulation of glutamine transporter may facilitate vitamin D prevention of breast cancer. So this is an amazing revelation. What this is showing is that just by having adequate amounts of vitamin D, activated vitamin D, this 125-hydroxy vitamin D or calcitriol, we are lowering the intracellular transport, basically taking it from circulation of the bloodstream into the cells, lowering glutamine uptake by 23%. Then, in addition to that, we are lowering the utilization of glutamine and glutamate by 31% and 17% respectively. Now, we're going to talk about several glutamine inhibitors, and they're going to have very strong effects, but they're expensive, they're difficult to get, and sorry to say, but good luck finding a doctor being able to or willing to administer these products, at least in this time. But vitamin D, on the other hand, has similar effects without having to go through all the pain of injecting yourself with these things. That's why, for me, it's very painful to see Dr. Seafried never talk about vitamin D in any of his lectures. And I find it to be one of the major blind spots that he has. I do think that metabolic therapy 
that he lays out is a fantastic foundation, but this is critical and I cannot ignore it when talking about cancer prevention and treatment. This next paper titled 125-Hydroxy Vitamin D Regulation of Glutamine Synthetase and Glutamine Metabolism in Human Mammary Epithelial Cells. And what it's saying here is that indeed 125-Hydroxy Vitamin D also reduce expression of this GLS-1 and GLS-2 genes, which code for glutaminases that shunt glutamine into the TCA cycle or the tricarboxylic acid cycle. Consistent with reduced entry of glutamine into the TCA cycle, 125-Hydroxy Vitamin D inhibited glutamine oxidation and the metabolic response to exogenous glutamine as analyzed by a particular cellular assay. So if you remember right, glutamine is, is a necessary chemical fuel for cancer, and it utilizes it for the production of ATP, but also for the production of biomolecules, both nucleic acids and fatty acids through the broken TCA cycle. What we've also talked about is glutamine is kind of a snowball because when there's excess glutamine metabolism, we see that that can set up a Warburg driving metabolism as well. So this is a very interesting finding because not only is it decreasing uptake into the cells, it's also decreasing its utilization by these damaged mitochondria within cancer for its ability to metabolize it. So it's cutting off the fuel at various levels. A lot of the drugs, as you'll see, when we talk about these glutamine blocking drugs only act on one particular enzyme. Vitamin D has diverse actions within the metabolism and uptake of glutamine, which I think is very exciting. I hope you're beginning to see why I am putting vitamin D, both the inactive 25-hydroxy, the active 125-hydroxy, and all of the D3 and L3 derivatives as the first videos after the video titled the Intro to Metabolic Therapy. Because although these important steroid hormone vitamins are not mentioned in Dr. Seafried's work, which is pivotal, which is groundbreaking, I'm not going to take away from that. This is one of the most important things you can do to reverse the metabolic aspects of cancer. And in particular, in this video, we're talking about its direct anti-cancer effects at both the nuclear level and the anti-proliferative effects of various cancers, including melanoma. But we're talking in particular now, the nitty gritty, the down and dirty about how vitamin D and its analogs can actually shut down glutamine metabolism, one of the necessary major fuels that cancer relies upon, both proliferating cancer cells and cancer stem cells, which is one of the major limitations of chemotherapy. Chemotherapy, at least classical chemotherapy, relies upon highly proliferating cells. And as you remember back way back to the cancer stem cell videos, that's one of the big conundrums within conventional oncology is that when we discovered that there's these cancer stem cells that are senescent, that are not rapidly dividing, yet they survive these onslaughts of chemotherapeutic regimens that destroys the proliferating cells, destroys the human organism, but then these cancer cells remain, it's a big problem for us. Whereas we can attack the fuel sources, glutamine and glucose, through various interventions, one of the most important interventions being vitamin D. Hope you're able to see that at this point. I look forward to discussing further the other actions that vitamin D has, particularly upon glucose metabolism, the Warburg effect, and through the actions upon HIF-1 alpha, which I'm excited to talk about in the coming few days. If you like this video, please like it, share, subscribe, and continue with us on this journey as fellow mitochondriacs and those looking to get to the truth of the maintenance of human health the prevention of age-related diseases and the reversal of age-related diseases, especially cancer. Until next time.